Last week I had recorded an episode that be that could have been titled Sovereignty, but chose not to upload it because after listening to it a second time, I came to realize that the complaint involved in the episode would have betrayed the argument that I made in, in some sense it would have it would have been a self canceling experience. And so instead we have taken some time to put together a better Piece, or I have, I have decided to take to take some time to put together put together a better piece on the term sovereignty, and sovereignty is going to be a word relevant to us whether we come from gun culture or America, and its relevance alone is not justification. Rather, we need to figure out what that means for us going forward. So, if you are ready to dig in with us on today's edition uh, edition of the Redacted Culture Cast, strap in because you are not going to need a dictionary for this one but it will give you something to think about as you go through your day. So, the term sovereignty is one that is most often heard in two different social circles. One of those is the Reformed theologians, and the other one is a certain sort of political group that calls itself the sovereign citizens. And but it, it could be described as a very extreme form of anarchism or libertarianism, but that those words don't mean what they used to mean anymore, and so we'll kind of move on. But sovereignty, in terms of philosophy, um, is attached to both religious and political means, which is why we t most often hear it spoken of in religious and political camps. But let's get on to it. <laughs> uh, this is, once again, using this Oxford Companion to Philosophy as an introductory point or a launching point. It goes something like this. Sovereignty which is a hard word to spell until you finally get it right enough times, uh, quote, the right by a governing power held against other powers to rule a designated territory, people, and their resources, a jurisdiction, and defend them from incursion. And how you think about this idea, this idea of sovereignty, reveals quite a bit on how you think about what a properly ordered, ordered society might look like. Because if you start from the top and you say, well, the world, the, um, the, 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 the president is like, or, you know, or the president rules and from here, or the king rules from there, he disseminates authority and something grants him authority, and he disseminates that authority, that responsibility, keywords in this one being uh, the right to defend them from, defend these from incursion then you might say, well, a king has a right to defend his kingdom against incursion, and so does a lord, and so does a governor, and so does a sheriff, and so on and so forth. And that is, de that is uh, sent from the top downwards. However, politically speaking, we, especially in the West right now, generally believe that sovereignty begins in the individual and works its way up. In other words, a man is sovereign over his household in the same way uh, a, man is, a man is sovereign over his household, and by understanding this, we understand that a government may be sovereign over its people. In other words, a man has the right to bear arms and defend his family, and by understanding this fundamental right at our lowest, and I don't mean that morally low, but our closest to baseline, closest to reality position, we can understand it in more abstract concepts, because an individual man is a is m less of an abstract concept than a government, or an abstract, let's call it an abstract object. But sovereignty also can mean something else. <coughs> and we have an issue for, uh, da, 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 and an issue about sovereignty and the way that it is, sovereignty tends to be used politically Oh geez, the 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 issue with how sovereignty is typically used politically is sovereignty uh, is it one of those words that, especially in politics and in culture, you see people wield sort of like a magic spell, and this is where mysticism comes in. Sovereignty is not something that once you master, you will have a better, more maneuverable environment in the world. Rather, it's a concept that we come we seek to understand and implement 
more justly in our society. At least that's what we would want to. Or it's something like a value, a rule set that we want to order our governing systems by. A system which reduces the sovereignty of the individual or imp infringes on the sovereignty of an individual would be something that we would call illegal, if not just immoral. Which is where we will come to get some, which is how we are going to reach some arguments. But the question uh, regarding gun control, but now here the question is how do we get there? How do we get to this idea of sovereignty? And that's where it becomes a religious subject. So what we're going to do for the remainder of this short morning segment is going to we're going to talk about the political concept of sovereignty and where it might come from. In order to do the first, we actually have to do the second. Now sovereignty originally, th this idea of sovereignty, the concept of sovereignty, much like the concept of rights, originated from the church. It originated from religious institutions which believed something like we are created in the image of God. And there's a difference here, and this is an important difference for you to be able to wield when you're engaging in both philosophical and historical events, is that just because there's a th that there are two different types of origin when we're talking about origin in this way. One of them is where did it, who was the first people, or to whom was it credited the idea of propagating this idea? That's a poorly, poorly said sentence. To whom is credited the, to whom do we credit in a historical account of, or to, to whom do we credit in a historical account who spread or uh, developed this idea? And so we could say something like, um, <coughs> Something like, um, you know, it was this, this idea originated in the church. The church came up with this idea, and then the rest of the world ga gra ga grabbed onto it, which is where you see this spoken a lot in American politics with terms like Judeo-Christian values. Now, here's the problem, though. Judeo-Christian values are not something that can be maintained without its foundation. And this is a problem. This is going to be a problem for those who believe that we can have our cake and eat it too, or more importantly, we can have our fruit from the vine without having to have be connected to it, without having the vine itself. In other words, we want the we want the thing that we want its its consequence, but we don't want the thing that re is required to have the consequence. And that if we talk about Judeo-Christian values, we could say that, well, the history of the United States was founded on Judeo-Christian values because it was founded by people who were seeking religious liberty and individual, uh, let's just call it sovereignty, a in a time where those two things were not being uh, accepted by the, or not being, what do you call it, perceived honored by the state that was the king of England or the kingdom of England. But there's more to it to that because where this is what the, that, that is the, that it might be like an origin story, but that's not the same thing as a foundation or where it comes from. And, and sovereignty is a good example. It's just like the idea of rights is a good example. You can't have the idea of rights without the thing that those, I, without the anchor point in reality that those rights are uh, anchored to. And for Christians, it is the fact that we are created in the image of God that we have rights. If you are not created in the image of God, it, then you are no different than the beasts, and the beasts don't have the same rights that you and I do as human beings. So that's the foundation. Where is the origin? Where is the root? Where is the foundation of the concept of sovereignty? Is a different statement than where d was it first started to be talking of, talked about in history? Well, you could say you could make the mistake of of believing that just because people use a certain word is that that means they founded the concept. Whereas <coughs> on in 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 philosophy, we have to deal with asking the question of in what is this grounded, rooted, or made connect, made manifest within reality. So sovereignty then, sovereignty is, a, as it is described by this, this book on, uh, or this uh, companion to philosophy, is a right by a government, a right, and I'm quoting it again, a right by a government held against other powers 
to rule a designated territory, people, and their resources. So it's a right, and where is that? And 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 we might say, well, the government governments, because it, it actually this explanation goes on to talk about the Treaty of Westphalia, um, but it but it goes on to say that there's there was a timeline in which it was not ju it was primarily a religious concept, and then it was later adopted by secular theorists. However, the question is, to what extent would that work? Because sovereignty. So let's think about the sovereignty in the case of the individual. Sovereignty would be the right to rule over your own property, your own household, and your own family in the extent that you may you know, function as who you are. You, may, you, you're not, you are not impeded in your l rights to live in, any, in the way that you choose. So we talk about things like a right, a religious freedom, right? A, a right to free speech or a right to religious and for freedom of religion is what you, we would call it. And the point on this is true, and where this thing comes from is it, is it recognizes that false converts don't make good citizens. People who are forced to believe something are much less beneficial to that society than those who choose to believe it willingly. And so if we develop a society which enforces a certain religious concept, then what we end up doing is, and I'm going to sneeze here, but that what we end up doing is we end up creating, <coughs> oof, we end up creating the exact same type of hellscape that we see in sort of communist countries and fascist countries and whatever, which is, or even some sections of Islam struggle with this, where if you are if you have the choice between confession and the sword, uh, what value is that confession? But we also, we recognize that within a political society, or we're supposed to recognize that within a political system, individuals, when their sovereignty is, per, is uh, honored by the state, um, it is, it, that is the only way to producing a properly functioning society or a rightly ordered society. And any example where it doesn't happen or in examples where it begins to infringe on said things, we find things like tyrannies. And tyrannies are not just things I don't like, they're actually moral condemnations. So what do we get out of this? And where does this go with sovereignty? So we've been talking about a little bit on kind of distinctions on, on how we think about sovereignty, but we have to address it from not only a metaphysics question, but also a political one. Let's jump into the religious. So oftentimes you'll hear people say something like, God is sovereign. And it's one of those phrases that is in danger, that, that, that it's one of those phrases that suffers and struggles because of how frequently it's used. Oftentimes, uh, uh, especially when it's spoken without conviction. And the idea that God is sovereign tends to mean one of two things. One of the thing, or, 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 or it can say, it can mean both at the same time, but it tends to imply two different ideas. One of them is that God being sovereign is the arbiter of morality, which is like the Euthyphro dilemma. That God is the point of arbitration for all of morality, which means what he, des what he decides is what we understand to be good. It's not that God is bound by some system that informs him how to be good. God, we understand goodness because goodness is the actions of God and the, the statements, the creation, the choices of God. Whatever God chooses to create in this world and whatever he chooses to demand as far as moral laws is functionally good. And it is good because he demands it. So God would be so one way that sovereignty is understood is that God is sovereign over morality. But that if we if we were to use that phrase it doesn't really match up to this earlier definition that we used for uh, sovereignty in the companion to philosophy because this one says the right by a governing power held against other powers and which other powers is God being held against? Their answer would be no. Because that is what the second application of God being sovereign oftentimes or can, can point to, and that is that God has absolute control 
over all things that are going on in, the, in his creation. And that can get close, and I, I should probably amend that statement, because that can get really close to what's referred to as occasionalism. But what, what it does mean is that God is sovereign over the world, over his creation, as in there is nothing that goes on in that creation that he is not aware of or is caught off guard by. He is all-knowing, omniscient in the sin. But if we had the word omniscient, why would we add sovereign to it? So sovereign bears a certain weight in referring to the sovereignty of God that, it, that combines both his point of arbitration and his position as God. Now you might want to say, uh, that which is sovereign over all of reality must functionally be the God of your, your worldview. It's similar to whatever is sovereign over the, your moral system functions as your God. So when we say that God is sovereign, not only are we stating, making a statement of fact, but we are oftentimes referring to the person who is God and claiming that he is sovereign. We are acknowledging that which is true. We are not making it so, but we are acknowledging it. And so if God is sovereign, he is sovereign over the creation. He is, he is, he is all-powerful and all-capable over uh, what he has created. But what does this mean for us? And how do we understand sovereignty in both a religious and a political sense? Well, on the one hand, we recognize very quickly that sovereignty is not something that's necessarily granted by a government, right? A government cannot choose whether or not you are sovereign over your, let's just say, your own body, your own will, your own choices. It, the only thing it can do is infringe on that sovereignty. So it can't actually pick and choose who is sovereign, who does have agency over their, themselves, but it can choose to infringe upon it. That, what that means is that there is a law, and a, the law of man is quite different than the law of nature. I can, essentially, I can break the laws of men and not be caught by them and pay no, con no consequence accordingly, whereas I cannot break the laws of nature. I cannot break the law of gravity in the same way that I break the law not to steal. Right? It's, not like, it's not like the law of gravity is such that it is a codified series of societal norms. Rather, it's just a different term. It's a term that we use for something that is, in this sense, unbreakable. You cannot break the law of gravity. We can only come to understand it better. So, just like we cannot break the law of gravity, we cannot break away from God's system of morality and consequences. So, and just like we cannot, but just like we can break, we cannot break the law of, just in opposition, the opposite of us not being able to break the law of gravity, we can break the laws of men, that also recognizes that regardless of whether or not my government sees it, I am actually sovereign over my choices. If I am in a position where somebody has a gun, a metaphorical gun to my head and puts another one in my hand and tells me to pull the trigger or else, I still have a sense of choice in there. I still bear some responsibility because I, st even though the the choices are stacked against me horribly, um, perhaps absolutely in this sense, I still have a choice. I still have a responsibility. I have a moral responsibility before that choice, regardless of how much force. And if you if we want to have another long conversation on, it's not even a long one on whether or not government is the uh, monopoly monopolization of force in a society. We'll get to that in a little bit. Not today though. And so sovereignty, when we talk about sovereignty uh, within our own lives, what we, have, what we come to recognize is that we have choices to make. And those choices exist within an environment that's not entirely within our control. But we are con in control of our choices. We have a responsibility to those choices as well. We ha get to choose how to act and when w so that when we obey the law, the law of man, we are doing so consciously, not just spinelessly, let's call it that way. If we, you know, if we, if we come to believe that we could do nothing else, that that's just the law, and the law has some sort of mystical power over our actions and choices, then we do so by diminishing ourselves. And this is where you get some of the problems in political philosophy, which argues that you can legislate certain forms of morality. 
there's a difference between saying that something should be illegal and whether or not it can be enforced. And I think the difference between those two things is one of them is a positive use and the other one is a negative use. And a negative being um, you're not allowed to commit murder is a different type of law than you are required to do a certain thing. So this being the case, Remember when we understand that we understand the concept of sovereignty because we are created in the image of the sovereign one part of that creation is individual sovereignty and the infringement on others sovereignties the, the sovereignty of others would in a sense be immoral it would be a sense of infringing on them now we do this to different extents and different degrees because we have to make choices and we have situations that need to, to take play uh, you know things like self defense or war that have their own weight to them, but how we understand it, how we understand what is right and true and good, and how we understand where these concepts come from, play major consequences in how we continue on as both a people and as a country. So when we abdicate our concept of sovereignty to the crowd, then we lose who we lose that right which is ours to claim. And, that's a, that, and that is a, a hefty sentence to close this out on. So when you're thinking about sovereignty this week, and if you are going to go into some of your day considering what it means to be sovereign, remember that you do have control over your choices. You have some control over it, whether it's with the bottle, whether it's with uh, the war, and whether it's with your finances, and whether it's with your world. So make decisions. You can be sovereign without being omniscient in this created order, but you're only sovereign over what is you, you, are, you have responsibility for, and those two things tend to match up hand in hand, and that is where we must close. If you're going to claim a right, you must bear its responsibility. If you're going to carry a firearm, you bear the responsibility of your ability to use it, and whether that use is the defense of somebody else's life or the defense of your own. If you don't if you, if you abdicate that sovereignty to somebody else, whether it's through claimed oppression or whatever, then you will probably find yourself, you are likely to find yourselves on the wrong side of the moral argument, not only in the short term, but certainly in the long term. In that, we close. So thank you for listening to the Redacted Culture Cast. And if you want to join us in further discussion, you can head over to redactedculture.locals.com, which is where we have the black site. Black sites where you get heads up, first notice, notification on the events and the goings on. We are putting on an event in 2024 that's going to be rather big. And the best way to get on the exclusive list for that is to become a supporter over at the Redacted Culture Cast or um, the, re the Redacted Black Site. If that is what it is for you, we look forward to letting you know uh, on what is going to come. That being the case, go forth and conquer.